Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have here once again this morning uh, to look into these things in your word to Daniel chapter 2 and, and its relation to Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12. Uh, we know, Lord, that um, there's a lot of ideas floating around in this world about how to understand the prophecies. You've given us a guidance in understanding your word. And so we just pray that uh, as we open the scriptures together, that we can follow the counsel that you have given. Uh, we pray for each person looking in, into these things. We pray for this movement and for the work in this earth. And we pray, Lord, that we can participate in this by obeying your voice. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so yesterday we read Jeff's article, The Eighth is of the Seven, and we read number three. And um, I had problems with this article. And, and my basic problem is that when we look at Daniel chapter two, uh, Daniel chapter two is not giving us the detail that we see in Daniel chapter seven or Daniel chapter eight or the prophecies of revelation. It's just a, an outline of the four kingdoms of Bible prophecy, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. <clears throat> and what this article of Jeff's does is it tries to take the the words uh, potter's clay and miry clay and distinguish them as a progression. He tries to show that the potter's clay is Smyrna and that the miry clay is Pergamus. And there's just no basis for that idea in the Hebrew Nothing about miry clay. In the King James, it does say miry clay. But we can see in whatever it was, Psalms, I can't remember, Psalms 42 or something, verse 2, where it talks about miry clay. He brought us up out of the miry clay. That's a different word. So you can't, you can't take that miry clay and say, yeah, Psalm 40, verse 2. Um, and say that that's how somehow a, a clay that's been corrupted or degenerated in some way. Because the expressions in Hebrew are simply a potter's clod and the other one is a clay clod. So there's not a distinguishing difference between those two. Um, now, so that was the first thing. So the first thing is that I don't think Daniel chapter 2 is giving us that detail about the churches that we see later. The other problem is that this idea that there are, that the stone smites the foot of the image in the time of Christ is not an Adventist interpretation. That's a Protestant interpretation of Daniel chapter two. And it just seems very strange to have this interpretation of Daniel 2 show up in this movement. It's something Parminder was trying to do um, in both bringing uh, uh, dispensationalism and a dispensationalism that was connected to a type of preterism. So, so it doesn't make sense from what this movement has taught in the past to take that interpretation of Daniel 2, and especially to do it in um, without any, any explanation about this, to say this is a new view, and we're not doing such and such. You know, we're not going in this direction, uh, that this is just some insight that we can see that we can take something from Protestantism and we can use it, but we're not going to go in that direction. 
Now, because if we just take that the fourth kingdom is Rome, that Rome becomes divided, right? So that it's going to be weak in the end. And it's going to be weak, not because of the singling of the uh, mingling of the seeds of men, of kings intermarrying in Europe, but because of church craft and state craft. That is, church and state will be combined at the end of the world. Now, it's true. We can look in the Pergamos period. We can see Constantine. We can see the first Sunday law. But there isn't a distinction being made there. That, that that first Sunday law is a type of the Sunday law that happens at the end of the world. And so we can see that Daniel chapter 2 addresses the end of the world. But the end of the world in Daniel chapter 2 is this vague period of Rome. Right, Rome, not just when it's divided, but just Rome in general. So it's it's not giving us any of these details in Daniel chapter two. Now we can look at later uh, uh, prophecies, and we can see those details, but we can't read them back into Daniel chapter two. We need to recognize that Daniel chapter two isn't giving us those details, and this is what Parminder was trying to do with Daniel chapter two. Now. We can take Daniel chapter two and we can lay out those four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, pagan Rome. And then we can lie alongside of that in a parallel column, the characteristics that we see in Babylon, obviously spiritual Babylon lines up with that. So, um, Let's see here if we right so when we were looking at at this before we were using uh, Collins uh, uh, study and we were looking at that a little bit but we we can see it here that we can say well Babylon that lines up with the papacy right spiritual but spiritual Babylon the arms medium Persia that lines up with the USA. The belly and thighs, of, which is Greece, line up with the UN. And then pagan Rome, there, you know, the legs. And we can line that up with modern Rome at the end of the world, the papacy at the end of the world. So we can do that. But that's not Daniel chapter 2. Right? That That is just making an application of Daniel chapter two by taking that history and seeing the parallel at the end of the world. Do, do we see the difference there? Because really Daniel chapter two just gives us Rome. Rome, and it's a divided state as well, but that's still Rome. Pagan Rome, it divides. Now it's going to eventually become papal Rome and all these other things happen. Do people understand what I'm saying here? In this detail of the feet, we can see the ten divisions, right? So we we can say that these 10 divisions, we're not going to define them. We're not going to say these are the 10 kings of Europe or this is, uh, you know, the 10 divisions of the world or anything. This is just a symbol of the world, right? The 10 toes. That's the completeness of the world. That's been the understanding. Yeah. And then we know that the clay... And the iron are church craft and state craft. Right? And at the end of the world, we know that church and state are combined. Now, that happens in pagan Rome. Happens all through the papal Roman period. It's going to happen at the end of the world again. But those details are not provided in Daniel chapter 2.
right? We can't use Daniel chapter 2 to show that what we see in Daniel chapter 7 or Daniel chapter 8 or Revelation 12, 13, or 17. It's going to provide us detail that isn't here. Right? I mean, we can all agree it provides detail that isn't here, right? Continue with your thought. Okay. So if it doesn't provide that detail, we can agree that some detail is, is not provided. If we're looking at the image that strikes the feet or the stone that strikes the feet of the image, that is the end of the world. Now, it's the end of the world in a very broad sense. We can agree with that. Like in Daniel chapter two, it's not distinguishing all the details of the end of the world. And so you can have it begin in the time of Christ and end in our time. Because that's still wrong. But what you can't do is it happened in the time of Christ as a type of what's going to happen in the end of the world and have Daniel chapter 2 as being fulfilled in the time of Christ. You understand the distinction here? No. Okay. We know the destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the end of the world. We can agree with that, right? Yes. <clears throat> and, and Christ made prophecies regarding the destruction of Jerusalem. Right? It's pray that your flight be not in the winter on the Sabbath day. You're going to see the armies com uh, compassing Jerusalem, and that's going to be a sign for you to flee, Right? Now, that's talking about Jerusalem. He's providing details. And we can see that those things then become typical of what happens at the end of the world. But there are aspects in that prophecy that don't apply to the time of Christ as well. Can we agree with that? That you couldn't just take uh, what Jesus says in, at the end of Matthew there and say, well, that was all fulfilled in the time of Christ. And um, we just make an application of it to the end of the world. Right? We're not preterists. Okay, are we approaching this of uh, on the premise of imperfect fulfillment and then perfect fulfillment? No. Okay. The prophecy in Matthew. So if we go to, you know, Matthew 24, right? He talks about the, for, the destruction of the temple. He's actually talking about the destruction of the temple, right? Okay. Okay, but he also has things in this prophecy, like the parable of the ten virgins, chapter 24 and chapter 25, that apply to the end of the world, that don't apply to his time. Right. That is, he he mixes these two together. He mixes prophecies dealing with the little destruction of Jerusalem and has mixed in events that are actually not going to happen in that time. Right. So he's moving from one to the other. He's 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 combining the events of the destruction of Jerusalem with the events that happen at the end of the world. This, this should be pretty clear to us from everything Ellen White said about um the destruction of Jerusalem.
So if you're going to take, for instance, we're reading Matthew 24 and you get to verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Was that fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD in any way? I would presume the way that you're asking the question, the answer would be no. Right. Is there anybody who would try to say, well, this was this was fulfilled in at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem or in connection with that history? When it says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. Was that fulfilled in the first century AD? The moon not giving their light, the star, the, the sun being darkened was not, no. Oh, how about the sound of the trumpet gathering the elect from the four winds from one end of the end of heaven unto another? Again. So we can, right. Yeah, so you see the point. So the point is Matthew 24 is telling us events that are happening with the destruction of Jerusalem, literal Jerusalem, but it moves into events that are only fulfilled at the end of the world. So within this story, the literal Jerusalem is being used as a type. Because we can also take the events of what happened with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we can we can see that it's typical of what happens at the end of the world. OK, but also in this prophecy, this prophecy goes to the end of time. Right. It goes to the second coming. So when we look at Daniel chapter 2, can we do the same thing? Can we say that Daniel chapter 2 is talking about events happening in the time of Christ? And that they're going to be typical of events that are going to happen at the second coming. I was looking at something else. Would you repeat that question, please? Okay. In Daniel chapter 2, yes. can, can we say that Daniel chapter 2 is talking about events that happen in the time of Christ that are typical of events that happen at the second coming? You know, specifically, does the stone smite the feet of the image in the time of Christ? No. Okay, which is what Jeff's article is saying, unless I'm reading it wrong. Well, that's part of part of the reason why I looked at what I did, but then I, I continued. I took Jeff's article and spent time breaking out, breaking this out paragraph by paragraph. Okay, now, I'll send this up to you. The the other part of it, <clears throat> some of what he gave reference to, I went back to the source documents. And there are still some questions that I have regarding this, but your questions are more pertinent at this time. Okay. So I think when we look at this with what he has written, we're going to have to establish for ourselves by comparing what we're seeing in scripture with what we're finding in spirit of prophecy to determine exactly 
the position that we're going that that we are going as a group to be able to use going forward. Okay. Yeah. So now you sent me a document this morning, uh, which is uh, a detailed study on Daniel chapter two, Correct. using the prophecy and uh, the King James translators, which is 35 pages. I know. So I don't think we can go through this document. So we would have to figure out what the highlights are, what things we would need to look at in this document. Um, Because I started looking through it and I'm like, this is this is way more than we need to do um, to address this point. Well, the the portions that I was that I was struck with as I read this through. Okay. By the time that I got to page six of what I sent up to you. Okay. So when you get to page six. Right here. This our, our, published, yeah, the non-published article. I think that the statements that Mrs. White makes in this manuscript 71 of 1910 Especially for, excuse me. Because she talks here about the charts. Okay. But the the first sentence of this, we want now to consider what is our future and we want to be wide awake in the matter. Mm -hmm. So she gives us, you know, a very tacit comment about the wise and the foolish virgins. How we want to be wide awake in these matters. Mm -hmm. Now she's coming back to this. Why the king had a dream of a great image. You have seen the great image represented on charts that our teachers present before the people. Then the king thought he would make just such an image. So he made a great image. He had a dream concerning it. But the dream all left him. Therefore, he said, if the wise men could not tell him the interpretation of the dream, every one of them should be killed. And she gives reference back here to Daniel 2, verse 5. It was a most unreasonable thing. But here were Daniel and his fellows. They went to God. They pled with God. And they asked him to take charge of the matter. And he did. Now, the rest of that article is worth reading, but I did not feel that we needed to go into that in such great detail. Okay. Now, in so many places, she has multiple references that she had given to this with Daniel 2. What we you mean the same, the same, like referring to the same thing like similar things you're just talking about repetition no she's you... she's giving um different she's commenting completely through here on what nebuchadnezzar was doing and what different verses had as far as the import for us for today so, like what you you were just right there, manuscript yeah. eighty five of nineteen ten. Well, now as we read on, we find that the Lord came right into His servants. They were to be destroyed. They were going to kill them all, and Daniel with them. But the Lord gave interpretation, and they understood it. Therefore, their lives were spared. Mm-hmm. So, we're dealing with this in reference to the Sunday law. We recognize that. As we would continue through here, we're given the examples of Daniel and his fellows. 
were being told that they had a living connection with the God of all wisdom. Now, in, in multiple places, we're being told that when the human agents shall exercise their facilities to acquire knowledge, to become deep thinking men, when they, as the greatest witness for God and the truth, shall have one in the field of investigation of vital doctrines concerning the salvation of the soul, that glory may be given to God of heaven as supreme. Then even judges and kings will be brought to acknowledge that in the courts of justice, in parliaments and councils, that the God who made the heavens and the earth is the only true living God, the author of Christianity, the author of all truth, who instituted the seventh day Sabbath for the foundations of the world that were laid, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, that's from letter 67 of 1894. That's one of Mrs. White's fairly common run-on sentences that could technically be a paragraph. Mm -hmm. Now, the following paragraph states that if we divorce God and his wisdom from the acquisition of knowledge, and you have a lame one-sided education, dead to all saving qualities, which gave power to man, so that through faith in Christ, he is capable of acquiring immortality. Now, when I sent this up, I recognized that 35 pages was going to be substantial for us to try to go through. But we can share this so that we can each read through this on our own. Yeah, that's what kind of what I thought we would do is I just put it into PDF and then email it to people. Now, <clears throat> throughout all of this, the second document that I'll be sending up to you, when I broke this out, I broke it out so that I numbered the paragraphs so that we could address who or what we are seeing in this particular presentation so that we could then ask our questions related to specific paragraphs. Then we could sit down. You mean who? I, well, I use who, what, where, and why as my questions whenever I'm examining something. So oh, okay. I'm not trying to confuse the issue. In this, we are each going to have to ask questions to be able to address this as a unit, whether we are agreeing with what's being written or whether we have a problem with it. So we are the who. Okay. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, to me, it's just pretty straightforward as far as the, what Jeff is presenting in that article is different than what we've taught. There are some differences, yes. And, and that, that the ideas there are, I'm very familiar with in Protestant commentaries, especially dispensationalist commentaries. Dispensationalists who are, because there's different types of dispensationalists, but ones who uh, use preterism, uh, a mixture of preterism and futurism. So, um, I just don't think that that article, so, you know, the reason I brought up the article is because, well, it's addressing things that we've been talking about. But I don't know how much time we should spend on it other than to just really point out the problems of it and be aware of it. Um, you know, that's basically why I, I presented it. Because... 
and and these aren't ideas that you know would we would say oh um support what colin is saying or you know are part of some kind of debate or anything um it just seems to me very odd that we have that article that that's so different from what we've had in the past And that, you know, and that's saying that I understand correctly what the article is saying. You know, it's possible I, I don't, but I don't see how you could get anything else out of it other than that. And it's supposed to build on old light, not contradict it. Well, yeah, see, so if we're going to introduce something that contradicts what we've taught before in the past, we should clearly bring out here is what we taught before and here is why this new light complements or establishes this old light mm -hmm. right because that's what new light is because the paper the article is let me see if i can find that phrase there because uh, he's talking about we're seeing new things right now in the context there, well, that sounds, well, you know, we can see old things in new ways, right? And there is a, a truth to that, that we can look at things that are, are um, old and see them in new ways. That, that's something that happens all the time. But uh, let me see if I can find this statement here that I was not happy with. So, so it's at the end of this. Okay, so the Alpha and Omega has made the correct pioneer un understanding of Daniel 2 new. And that doesn't make any sense to me. That is a bit difficult. <clears throat> right. He's saying that the pioneer understanding is actually wrong. Well, right. Well, the way he's the way it's being written, <clears throat> it's alluding that there is a pioneer understanding that is correct and a pioneer understanding that is not correct. Well, yeah, what he's saying, what I gather from reading the paper is that the idea of Alpha and Omega. So when he talks about Alpha and Omega, he's saying there is an Alpha that is an application that we could look at with Daniel chapter two and an Omega application and that the pioneers didn't understand this, right? The pioneers didn't, didn't have that knowledge. And so they just simply placed the end of this uh, Daniel chapter two as being the second coming of Christ. But we have this understanding because of alpha and Omega that we can see that it was fulfilled in the time of Christ. And that fulfillment in the time of Christ becomes a type of it being fulfilled at the end of the world. I mean, to me, it's very clear that's what Jeff is saying in this article. That, that is what the article is saying. So then it says, this view, this understanding, we has made the correct pioneer understanding of Daniel to new. But but that doesn't make sense. What do you mean the correct understanding of Daniel 2? The correct pioneer understanding. Right? It, it's actually not using the pioneer understanding at all. It, it's a way of saying, well, the pioneers were correct, but they weren't really correct because they didn't understand the alpha and omega applications. And so we can take their understanding, set it aside, and say, well, if we correct it, it's now new. I, I, I mean, I don't know if everybody really followed when we went through the study yesterday, really understood, you know, because we're looking at something just for the first time, this article. And, and I really think that people need to read it over. Um, I don't know if I want to go over it again, 
I mean, you, you have a document, you say you can send us, maybe we can take some highlights from that. But you know, at the end of this article, what he says about the new, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I don't, I don't know, I don't really know how to take this article. I mean, it's not teaching us something that we understand in this movement. Right? So, so we've never done this before with pioneer writings. Right? I, I've, I've never done this with the pioneers before to say, well, they were wrong. Because every time I look at the pioneers' writings, they're correct. Now, it is true that sometimes they don't see certain things, and he talks about that. You know, they, they, they can only see so far, and we can agree with that. But their basic interpretations are correct. Now, the only time that we have something in the pioneers' writings that I would say are wrong is when they interpret Daniel chapter 11. That is not the whole of Daniel 11, but verse 40 to 45. When they have that referring to the literal events, they're having literal king of the north, literal king of the south coming against France. And there they're departing from Miller's rules. So, so we can say, well, they're wrong there. But, but that's not a a foundational understanding of something like Daniel chapter two, right? That's more a periphery sort of um, point that they have. None of their main arguments dealt with the understanding of Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, right? We can agree with that, that that wasn't a major tenet of their, their teaching. Can, can we agree with that? It never was. Yeah. Okay. So so we can say, well, they were wrong on that point, but it's not something major, right? It's not it's not pertinent to what they were preaching, really. But Daniel chapter two, can we say that that wasn't a part of their major part of their teaching? No, Daniel chapter 2 was a huge portion of their teaching. Right, it's right on the charts. So so if you're going to say, well, the foot the stone doesn't strike the foot of the image at the end of the world. It really strikes it in the time of Christ. That's a major departure departure from what the pioneers taught. So, so that to me is is a problem. It's we're just saying they were wrong. You know, you can't say you made the correct understanding, the pioneer, the correct pioneer understanding, new in this article, because it's it's really just saying that they were wrong. We, now we could say, well, they didn't understand Alpha and Omega, and if they would have understood what we understood, they would have accepted what we're, we're teaching. In this article. But they didn't teach that. They wouldn't have taught that. They wouldn't have said, you know, that the stones smote, smote the feet of the image in the time of Christ. All, all we can say is that Daniel chapter 2 doesn't give us, it doesn't define out the different things that are going to happen after Rome. It just has Rome. It has the fact that there's going to be this mingling of church craft and statecraft, that is church and state, and Christ is going to come in the time of Rome. But you can't put those details in there and say that this is actually talking about events happening in pagan Rome, because because this is what he's arguing, is that Smyrna is this potter's clay and Pergamus is the miry clay. That's all pagan Rome. 
Christ came in the time of pagan Rome. That's when he set up his kingdom. That is what the stone smiting the foot of the image is referring to, is coming, is Christ at his first coming. We've never taught that. Now, if it is truth, then, you know, we would have to say the pioneers were wrong. We couldn't say that they were correct because they would have stood against that because that's a teaching of preterism. Preterism teaches that Daniel chapter two is referring to events that happened in connection with the first coming of Christ. And that there's no hint of the second coming of Christ in the book of Daniel. Right. Atonement is completed at the cross. Everything that Jesus was talking about, the end of the world, that was just the destruction of Jerusalem. And no prophecies go beyond the destruction of Jerusalem. And then if you're going to apply them at the end of the world, you could only apply them as a repeat of history. So, so I think we have a serious problem that this movement is facing at the present time based upon this article. And not just this article, but other articles that Jeff is writing. They throw something into the movement that becomes a major problem. Now, Jeff had stepped out because of his belief of the parallel with William Miller, right? Did he do it that for that reason, or was it because he viewed the mission of Future for America was done? Yeah, but the reason why he did that, he said, is I'm he says he's a parallel to William Miller, and William Miller uh, failed to recognize the truth. And so his idea was if he steps out, then he's not going to make the mistake of Miller of supporting error. Right. So he didn't want to be a distraction to what the movement was doing. Right. I mean, that's why he, he said that Future for America's mission was accomplished. Miller's mission was accomplished. I mean, he said this pretty pretty explicitly, but that's why he was stepping out. In that same vein, Miller's work was to open up the first and the second angel's messages, right? Well, mostly the first. So we would say Snow is the second. So Miller's really just addresses the first angel's message, but... I mean, he did support the second angel's message, you know, briefly before October 22. But um, his his work primarily was the first angel's message. He didn't really have anything to do with the second, you know, to figuring out October 22nd or anything like that. So we can see Jeff parallels uh, Miller in that sense, right? Okay. But for him to come back and to begin writing articles again, without supporting the light that has been coming to this movement since July 18, not even addressing it really, um, I don't. I don't understand the purpose of it. And then when I see an article like this, then I'm, I'm wondering what's going on. I mean, the movement, it's going to cause confusion to the movement. We already have a lot of confusion in the movement. So I don't, I don't know what, you know, and, and I don't like being in this position of, of, of criticizing Jeff's article. 
right? Because because I don't want to criticize Jeff because one is I don't think that he he deserves to be criticized, even even if he wrote something that doesn't make sense. People write things that don't make sense. But that's you know he's definitely not our enemy, and and he's not somebody to be attacked. So well, we have this reality of what is happening in the movement, and this this paper, this article, is is going in a wrong direction because this movement has been studying now you know, for over three years since July 18. And we've received a great deal of light. And I don't see that these articles provide any light in what I've read in them. They they provide things that we already know, some of them, right? Things that we can agree with that were well established. But here to come up with this interpretation of Daniel chapter two, I don't think it provides light to the movement. And, and so this is, to me, this is a major problem that we have to address. Like, I don't really know what to do about it. <clears throat> now we can comment, right? We can, we can log into Future for America. We can comment on it. Um, You know, you know, and even here you can see Pat Rampey makes a comment. He says, it's amazing how whether you count the kingdoms of world history or the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, that Rome always comes up eighth and is of the seven. Now, we know that that's true. Right. We can we can do this. We can divide the kingdoms in this way because we, we do it in in Revelation. But I don't think that we can do this in, in Daniel chapter two. And so I know what we did in the movement, which um, we have in 2015, because um, um, Iran sent me a, a video. Uh, the video is um, Noel presenting in 2015 on um, uh, Daniel chapter two dealing with uh, the eight kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Um, I'm just going to find it here. Um, okay, so... see it yes. okay now uh, here I'll show you the, the screen of this so this was in um, 2015 May 10th right is that what that says around uh, 2015 05 10 so I think it's May 10th yeah or it's October right. 8th it's not October 5th. Now, are you sure this is 2015? That's the date that was on it. Okay, okay. Well, this, this does make sense because here he's dealing with uh, uh, the seven kings, right? So you see there on this chart, you got Manasseh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah. You got 607, you have the 70 years. Then you have Cyrus, 537, to Artaxerxes, 457, uh, the first seven kings of Persia. Um, and then you're going to get to the seven thunders here in 1798 to 1844. 
and then the Seven Thunders again in 1989, right? So these are things we were teaching back in 2015. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, just, you know, I'm looking at the whiteboard here. Uh, I guess that whiteboard was still being used in 2015 as the whiteboard. So it wouldn't be till later to get the new one, okay. Um, And, and the date on it, it was, how was it dated? Was it just, is this the date that was written out like this? And you had other dates? I'm not sure what you mean, but the date is part of the title. I just reformatted it. Okay, so it was in such a way you could see it was clearly May 10th? Yes. On October 5th, okay. Because I know there was a camp meeting in October in 2015, but... But this doesn't look like it'd be the camp meeting. This looks like the class, uh, the classroom, which would probably have been at um, uh, that uh, mobile home building, the one that was uh, that portable one anyway, um, which isn't there anymore. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, so I'm just trying to figure out the time here. So in 2015, um, what, what he's addressing here is these kingdoms of prophecy, and he's going to set up, this is based, is this a study of Daniel chapter 2, or is it just a study on the, I don't, because I don't see Daniel chapter 2 here. I'm just trying to see if I can see the whole chart here to get to you. Okay, so this is dealing more with the seven heads and then the eighth. Is that what this is addressing? Did you look it over? I didn't have time to watch it. Yeah, I think it's dealing with Revelation 17 mostly. Yeah, so this isn't the type of study what Parminder was doing later, right? So, so this understanding we've had for a long time, right? So we can all agree that this is how we understand Revelation 17. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal. Five are fallen, right? The sixth, USA. The seventh is the UN with the ten kings. And there's going to be a threefold union at the end because the, the ten kings, they're going to allow the papacy to do what it wants to do, right? With the United States as part of that. So that's the threefold union. So there would be nothing wrong about this. So what we what we need is to see the study that more parallels this study. Because this study where we take uh, and lay them out in this parallel way. This is the study that I think um, that Jeff is applying. Right? So he's saying, Daniel chapter 2 is this history. And the stone smiting the feet of the image is in this history. You know, you might say, okay, we have this divided Rome. That's still going to be Rome, right? Pagan Rome. Right in that history, and then this is just a repeat of history, and we can see this parallel. Medo Persia does line up with the USA, Greece does line up with the UN, Rome, pagan Rome does line up with the papacy, and the papacy here at the top does line up with Babylon. But we can't say that Daniel chapter 2 is fulfilled in the history of pagan Rome. Except in the sense that we know that Rome is the final kingdom and that it's undifferentiated in Daniel chapter 2. It doesn't tell us about the papacy. It doesn't tell us about all of the details of these different Nations. It doesn't tell us about the United States. 
doesn't tell us about the UN except hinted at by the ten toes. Right? Can, can we agree with that? Or do we need to study this further to, to see if we can agree with that? I would Any think we have to discuss, we're going to have to study this a bit further. Okay, so what do we need to study? Right now, as I am as I'm looking at this, there is a document that was referenced within what what Elder Jeff was presenting. Okay, what document is this? Manuscript number one, 1852, that comes from Spalding and McGann, pages 2A to 3. Okay, yeah, so, so we're familiar with that one. But there's some interlineations that you got to really dig for. And there's quite a bit here from other references that also came from A.T. Jones at a later date. Okay. So can we look at those right now? I'm What I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to get it pulled together with all the interlineations. And it's kind of a problem because the way that the, the White Estate has this, they bury the interlineations and I'm trying to put it so that it's all out so that we can look at this at one time. Okay, so Spalding and McGann is um, a collection that Spalding and McGann got of some letters of Ellen White's. You're saying that they have the originals of these with interlineations? I'm saying that they posted the, inter they, they posted the document with the interlineations Okay. But what, really, doc, what document did they post is what I'm asking. Did they post, are these in Spalding's and McGann's uh, collection, or are they the actual originals that Ellen White wrote before they were collected by Spalding and McGann? That's what I'm asking. I'm looking at what's supposed to be the originals that were also published in Spalding and McGann's. Okay, so Spalding and McGann didn't have the originals. There, I cannot be certain of that. Well, I'm pretty certain they did not. Okay. They had copies of things that Alan White had written that had been unpublished, and they put them together into a collection. Right. These were published. Now, Ellen White wouldn't have interlineations on in the Spalding and McGann collection as published by Spalding and McGann, right? Because they didn't, they didn't have the originals. They just had copies, and then they published these. So if we have interlineations, this would have to be in the, in the originals that Ellen White wrote that were later published by Spalding and McGann which they wouldn't have had access to. That's my understanding of Spalding and McGann. Okay. But I didn't know that the originals existed in the LNG White Estate. Well, I've so. just finished, from, from what I'm looking at right now, I have found this on their site, the... Um, document with the interlineation has 11 separate further notes and I've so far been able to copy two of them. Okay. And so I'm working on the rest of this to be able to send this up to you. Okay. So the, on the LNG White Estates, they put the interlineations in there? Yes. 
You have to click on them. Okay. They don't have that on the LNG white disc, though. We'll spot no. it again. Okay. Yeah, because I know often she would go through things that she'd written and write stuff in the margin or in, or between lines or whatever once they were typed up. There, there's quite a bit of this that they, they give reference to where certain specific comments are in brackets and they note that the items that are presented in these brackets are part of her handwritten notes. Yeah. That okay. we're approving of the document. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So this issue of the church craft and statecraft, because Ellen White clearly is taking Daniel chapter two and applying it at the end of the world. Right. Correct. I would agree. Well, so she's not saying church craft and state craft, even though we can see that they're working in the time of Pergamus, Pergamus, right? We still wouldn't say, you know, the, the stone smites the feet, foot of the image in the time of Pergamus, or that Ellen White is applying this at the end of the world as an application, as a repeat of history. She seems to be directly saying that Daniel chapter two, when you have the that division that occurs. And see, the thing is, you have it when the division occurs, when you have this church craft and state craft, you could say, well, that begins, you know, because this is what Jeff is saying, it begins in Pergamus. But the thing is, it's just it's just a characteristic of the history of Rome at the end of the world. So it may be true it began in Pergamus because we already understand 321 is the first Sunday Sunday law. But it just seems to me to be illogical to say, well, Christ dying in the time of Ephesus is showing the foot the the image, his kingdom being set up in the time of Pergamus. So <laughs> Okay, so if you can get those together. So I know this is a, <laughs> it's a controversial study, what we're doing right now. I mean, this is not, um, you know, because we're addressing, you know, Jeff's articles, and we're saying there's things wrong with them. And, you know, we're opening, opening up ourselves to criticism in the sense that we could be seen as criticizing Jeff. But to me, I'm not criticizing him as a person. I'm just saying that what he wrote in the article isn't correct. <clears throat> right. And he's and he's taking this fra phrase, miry clay, and saying that means dirty clay. But the word is just clay. That's really it, it's translated as miry in the King James. But the word itself just refers to clay. And, and the word that's translated as clay refers to a clod. So this is just iron mixed with a clay clod. And of course, when you talk about a potter's clod, you know that you're talking about a clay clod. So it's just once it refers to it as a potter's clod, the other time as a, a clay clod. But nothing here about dirt, nothing here about a degeneration. <clears throat> so, so that's where I would have, you know, this, this problem. Okay. Um, Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, William. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, you know, if you take a clay, a clay, uh, clay I mean, clay, and it's um, in a clod like that, what is it like? Hmm? 
Just a lump of clay. Yeah, but what is it like? In... I don't know what you mean. It's like in moisture, ain't it? No, not necessarily. Well, lump I've of clay. Whole, yeah, I've seen a whole lot of clay pods, and it and it's like moisture. It's like in the moisture. Okay. Well. Yeah, there's nothing here that shows it lacks moisture because it's a potter's clod. So it, all it is is it's a lump of clay that a potter is going to work on. That's that's what it's first referred to as a potter's clod. And then it, it says it's a clay clod, which is implied if it's a potter's clod. But there's nothing about it um, lacking moisture. You know, so where we were going to go before we started studying uh, Jeff's letter yesterday is that we were going to look at these kings, right? So we're dealing with the seven and the eight. So, so Jeff's article addressed Daniel chapter two, which we had already studied, you know, last week. And then it addresses this eight and seven. Now, when we're looking at the eight and the seven here, uh, we're looking at it in the context of the kings of Persia initially. Well, I guess probably initially the kings of Judah, or even if you want to say initially the seven thunders. But the, the study that Noel does, which we're familiar with, is the idea that we have the seven kings of Persia. We have the first seven kings of Persia, and we have the last seven kings of Judah. And those things line up together. They're, they're connected. That is, it's, they, they illustrate a history which we would call Millerite history, right? The seven thunders. And, and the thing about the kings of Persia, of course, is they have a time of the end and they have three decrees um, under seven thunders that are going to then commence the 2300 days. And in Millerite history, you have three messages in the seven thunders that are going to mark the end of the 2300 days. So that's sort of the starting point for this whole study of, of applying the presidents of the United States to this numbering system. Right? Because we're, we're using the kings of Persia and the kings of Judah. Now, when we initially counted, we used Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Um, there's going to be three that stand up yet in Persia, and the fourth is going to be far richer than them all. And he's going to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. In applying that to Trump, we have another type of count. This count has at the top here, you can see here, the four, Right. Cambyses, False Myrtus, Darius, and then Artaxerxes, or not Artaxerxes, uh, Xerxes, right? So we don't have Artaxerxes here. We don't go all the way to the seven in this count. And so when we line it up with our history, this brings us only to Trump, right? And then we have a study, which this study was not originally done by Jeff. So the study of these um, emperors was done by uh, blessings. And Odilio is going to refer back to this earlier study. And I have the study I know on my, my computer somewhere. Um, and then he's going to connect this to what we understand about July 18, 2020. So he's going to count uh, these kings, and he's going to place Trump as uh, the sixth king. That is, he's going to start not with Octavia or Octavius, Augustus, Caesar Augustus. Uh, he's going to start with Julius Caesar. So, he's, and and you can see that this count here we have starting with Reagan is number one. Uh, that's going to be connected to. Odilio study. So both Colin and Odilio are going to start so that they make Nero number six or Trump number six. 
Trump, Nero. And then you would have to do the same thing with the kings of Persia, right? You would have to have Darius the Mede as number one if you have Reagan as number one. Correct? So this is sort of where we left off before we went to Jeff's letter. And so we see that there's a problem here. So this problem is one that we need to sort out. Um, can we start at Reagan as number one? Can we start at Julius Caesar as number one? Can we start as Darius the Mede as number one? Well, that doesn't seem like we can. Because he's not a Persian king. He's a Median king. Just so um, this, re yep. uh, referring, referring back to uh, Thursday study. Yeah. Um, I, I had suggested originally that Manasseh equated to Reagan and that Reagan was the one that forgot. And um, but you had suggested that um, was not going to be the case, you know, that Cyrus would line up with Manasseh. And then, so that would be like Bush. Um, but I think uh, I just remembered that Jeff had applied um, from what I remember, that Manasseh had made it to Reagan, and that he, uh, there's a quote that he used from Ellen White, where he says something like, those who no longer understand who the Antichrist is, is going to be on the side of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, he, he applied that to, to Reagan, who forgot who the Antichrist was, and then ended up making this here holy alliance with him. Okay. So he lined those up then with the kings. So he's going to have Reagan as, as lining up with Darius the Mede? Or is he going to have Reagan no, lining up? Uh, well, Manasseh and the seven kings, the last kings of Judah, he aligned yeah. up uh, Manasseh with Reagan. Yeah, I understand that. I understand what you said there. So he's going to line up Reagan with Manasseh. So that means he would then, if he's going to line him up with the kings of Persia, is he right lining Reagan up with Cyrus is what I'm asking. Like in, in a study, you're saying in a, that happened sometime in the past. I don't know when. When was the study about what time? Oh, well, like, well, Reagan, Reagan would, would have been lined up with uh, uh, Darius the Mede. Would he not? Well, yes, that's what I'm saying. So we line up Reagan with Darius the Mede, but you still see the problem. The problem is, should they all line up and be consistent? That is, if I have like Reagan lining up with Manasseh, and I line up Manasseh with Cyrus, Right, because that's how we did it. Right, you would agree that he lined up uh, Manasseh with Cyrus. I can't remember. Did he not? Was Darius made not used? No. Well, because he has the first seven kings of Persia, right? So the first seven right, kings, okay. of, he lines up with the last seven kings of Judah. And so when he lines up Manasseh, he lines them up with Cyrus. Right, okay. And if he lined up Reagan with Manasseh, then again, you just have an inconsistency, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you would have to decide, how do we do that? I mean, maybe in some ways you put Darius the Mede and Cyrus together and Reagan, but then do you put Reagan and Bush together as you know, they're both sort of the first. Or, you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. there, there has to be a consistency here. So my understanding was Reagan lines up with Darius the Mede, right? In the line of this, the last seven kings of Judah, we have Manasseh line up with Cyrus, right? Which I'm pretty sure that Jeff does. Like I'm 100% certain he does because I've seen the studies. But if he lines up Manasseh with Reagan, 
then that would be inconsistent if Reagan lines up with the rise to meet. Right. So it's still the same problem. It just so we have to sort that out. We have to say how we understand these um, these kings obviously is important. Um, now, when it comes to the Caesars, we have, you know, Julius Caesar is not is not an emperor, right? So, I mean, he's a Caesar, but he's not the emperor. Augustus is the first emperor of Rome. Plus, if we look at the time of the end, the one that we have at the time of the end is Augustus. We don't have Julius Caesar as... You know, he's, he's not alive when Christ is born, but Augustus is, right? So for having John the Baptist or Christ marking the time of the end, in that history, it's in the time of Caesar Augustus that we would have to start these, these uh, emperors. And so, so this is the study that was, was not done by Jeff, it was done by Blessings. And uh, Tabo presented it. And then Odilio picks up on this. And with that, they're going to start the count at at uh, Julius Caesar for some reason. As being the, the first emperor, even though he's not. Um, and then you're going to end up again with, you know, these five are fallen, so to speak. The one he is is going to be Nero. Because Nero is going to be the sixth if you start with Julius Caesar, right? But we know Nero is is typifying Trump, but here in this case, Nero is the fifth. So Trump is also the fifth if we look at the parallel that he's Xerxes, because Xerxes is the fifth. Now, in taking these uh, last seven kings of Judah, um, if we're if we're going to line them up with with these other kings, the first seven kings of Persia, Manasseh lines up with Cyrus, Ammon, Ammon lines up with Cambyses, Josiah with False Myrtus, Jehoahaz with Darius the first, Jehoiakim lines up with Xerxes. Jehoiachin with Artabanus, um, and uh, and then Zedekiah with Artaxerxes, right? And then in this case, you would say, well, Jehoiakim is lining up with Trump in some way, right? So with the history of Trump, now it's going to be in Jehoiakim. That's going to be the history where Daniel is taken captive. So, so this is something that we have studied in this movement. We, this was introduced, in my understanding, in 2015. We're going to start looking at this. Well, technically in 2014, because Jeff is going to deal with uh, uh, the four seven times, right? And he's going to line that up with these kings of Judah. And... And, we're, and then we're going to have the kings of Persia coming along as, you know, trying to understand that, the kings of Judah, the kings of Persia. And it's going to develop and we're going to be referring to it, but it's not completed. That is, we don't have this really defining presentation where we bring it all together and it all makes sense. Right. So what we have are, are these inconsistencies, these applications that don't really fit together having Manessa line up with Reagan, but also having Manessa lining up with Cyrus. So, so this is kind of the, the mess that we have to sort through, right? And then, of course, with the emperors, I mean, I have Augustus there as number one, because he's the first emperor. And then we have, uh, you know, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, are really all within the same year. Um, you know, so in that year, you're going to have Galba. He's, he's going to 
you know, begin in 68. But in 69, he's emperor. Otho's also emperor in 69. And so is Vitellius, right? So those three kind of go together. And then Vespasian is the one who's the emperor um, when Jerusalem is destroyed. And then Titus is going to be the emperor, um, even though he's the one who's involved in the destruction of Jerusalem. He's going to be the emperor during the time that uh, um, Pompeii is destroyed and Herculeum are destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. So in the fall of 79. And and those and the destruction of uh, Pompeii and Herculeum are connected to the judgment uh, against Rome for the destruction of Jerusalem. So, so some way this study of the emperors uh, needs to be resolved, and it needs to be incorporated into our understanding of the presidents of the United States and to the first seven kings of Persia and the last seven kings of Judah. So, so we have a number of little, a number of things that we're studying. I should actually show you this chart. Um, number of things that we've been studying that we have to pull together. And, you know, so so we'll, we'll send out the documents for Daniel chapter two, the other document dealing with Jeff's article, um, and then this new document that Dwight's getting uh, dealing with the Spalina McGann uh, statements dealing with churchcraft and statecraft. And also, I guess, the statement, some statements that H. E. Jones makes. But but you you can see, hopefully people can see that the Jeff's article is a major issue. That it it steps outside of how we have understood Daniel chapter two as Seventh day Adventists. I hope people can see that. Well, okay, one one other point as I'm getting the rest of this pulled together. Mm -hmm. um, for us to consider this, and, and since we will all have these documents later, I, I want to have this, this other one finished today. Okay. So that it can go out for tomorrow's meeting. But I'm going to read something very quickly from one of the one of the footnotes that the conference put into this. Okay. It is possible that this is an allusion to the condition of the popular churches whose errors would continue to accumulate before Earth's final events. And this comes from one of the final paragraphs that says, they advocate their errors for a while until the people get disgusted with it and then they add another, meaning another error. Prior to 1852, Sabbatarian Adventists had thought of the fall of the churches as a past event, culminating in 1844 with the second angel's message of Revelation 14 and the call to leave the churches of Babylon. In June of 1852, however, James White first published a broad review containing of continuing deterioration of the churches after 1844, leading to a future and final warning to come out of Babylon, a view that was to become the dominant one among Seventh-day Adventists. So the reference here is given to a review article of June 24th, 1852, and then continuing for a survey of early development in the understanding of the second angel's message, they give reference back to Damsteed's Trieste on pages 179 to 192. Okay. So this 
this document in reference to manuscript 1, 1852 has multiple references also to manuscript 2, which is interlineated in a similar manner. So I'm going to try to have all of this pulled together and then sent back up. Yeah, so the thing about Spalding and McGann is they have collected things from Ellen White's early writings. Correct. Right, because they, they're even going to have that uh, early writings, page 74, uh, that vision that you had at um, um, the guy with the charts. What's his name? Um, the 1850 chart. What's the guy's name? The 1850 chart. Anyway, at his house. Just can't think of it. <laughs> I can't hear you, Stephen. What'd you say? I said Otis Nichols. Yeah, Otis Nichols. Right. Yeah. You were just all distorted when you said that the first time. Yeah, at Otis Nichols' house. So that's also in the Spalding and McGann collection. So they had gathered some of these early copies of these early uh, visions. Um, so, okay. Um, well, we should close with prayer, but yeah, we have a lot of work ahead of us. I'm not sure how to, to approach it, but we'll just do our best. Okay, well, let's, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we had to study this morning. We just pray for your continued help in all that we do. We pray for, for health and um, spiritual health, mental health and the blessings that you promise as we continue to walk with you. We know, Lord, that trials come. And we just ask, Lord, for the strength to go through those trials as we connect with Christ. Um, thank you for each person studying these things. Bless them. And we ask that we can come together to again, come together again to study your word tomorrow morning according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.